Good evening, everyone. Um, just going to make a quick intro. My name is Azaf Neymar. Uh, I'm the Kadarza Student Speaker Series. Um, I had this event, had this event together with Yoni Greenwald, who invited uh, David Lichtenstein and Harry Rothenberg to speak to us tonight, and with uh, Cardozo Rila, Real Estate Law Association. Um, so everyone should, everyone that took part in, um, in that should be uh, thanked. Mm -hmm. um, David Lichtenstein is the founder of um, one of the largest privately owned real estate groups in the country. Um, and, you know, he started it all by himself. And you're, I can't wait, and you probably can't wait to hear an amazing story from him and from uh, his follow-up act that's going to be uh, Harry Rothenberg. So everyone, um, please welcome David Lichtenstein. So it's nice to meet a bunch of bright, inquisitive, young, not yet futuristic attorneys. Um, one of the people here asked me to tell over a story that um, happened a few years ago. He said he had heard, is it true? And I, he said, yeah, so could you tell it over? I said, okay. I was in, the, um, <coughs> I was in uh, Israel in the King David Hotel, and I'm in the lobby, and I see Michael Steinhardt. Um, he has a very um, distinguishable mustache. I would not repeat the story, but he's repeated it in public. <laughs> So I figured that gives me the grace to do so too. And I admire him greatly. He's one of the you know, driving forces behind Birthright, as well as many other <coughs> Jewish identity. Uh, and so I went over to him, and I also know that he's very proud of being an atheist. Even though agnostic atheist, it changes hourly. <coughs> and um, I went over to him, and I said, Michael, I really envy your share in the world to come. So he looks at me and he says, well, there's nothing to envy. He has, like a, he has a deep voice. He says, I don't believe in the world to come. It was a good setup for me. So I said, you're a trader, right? Famous hedge fund trader. He said, yeah. I said, I have a deal for you. Win-win. I said, you think your share in the world to come is worthless. I think it has value. I'll buy your share in the world to come for $100,000. I'll give it to you now a check. So I'm getting something that I think is a value, and you're getting a check, something you think is no value. He said, fine. I pulled out a piece of paper. It happened it was a real estate alert on me. And he wrote on the back, I, Michael Starnhart. He, he asked me to dictate. So I, Michael Starnhart, sell to David Lichtenstein the mitzvah of birthright and any and it's share in the world to come for $100,000, signed Michael Steiner, and I gave him the check, he gave me that, and we concluded the transaction. In fact, the next morning he came over to me by breakfast, he says, if you want, you can change your mind. I said, on the contrary, if you want, buy it back, I'm gonna have to get it appraised. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I told him, because I couldn't resist it, I said, you know, I would have given you a million ideas for it. And that he like you know you never want to tell it to a trader that he undersold the stock. <laughs> so I, I think I ruined his day. He didn't mention this and the fact that I ruined his day. So I put to you a bunch of law students, curiously, do you think it's a valid sale? Yes. Well, we we have one yes. Do we have anybody who hold who who would feel differently? Sounds like not. Because um because I guess one, how are you going? How are you going to appraise it? And two, it's not. Um, you know, we don't really buy and sell anything except for services and goods, and that's neither. Well, I leave that to you to debate. But that, this is a real story, and he's actually repeated in the in the in the why. But I'll tell you a funny follow up. Two years later, I was there visiting my. My son and daughter, went with, she was in seminary and he was in yeshiva. And I said, well, I'm again in the King David. And I said, why don't you join us for the Shabbos meal? So he said, I'm having dinner tomorrow night with Mark Rich, a uh, famed Phil, Phil Broke. He had to escape the country and Hillary, I'm sorry, and then Bill pardoned him, the famous story, right? 
I said, listen, you could have it with a bunch of yeshiva boys. That's college. That's a Shabbos meal. You're going to have it with a fugitive from the wall. What kind of Shabbos is that? He says, look, I made an appointment, and that's it. Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock, I get a call. He's coming with an entourage, him, his wife, his goblin, whatever. And they came. And we sang, we danced for like three hours. So when it comes to benching, <coughs> um, those are the prayers that are after the meal, right? Grace after meal. If you have 10 people, there's a special blessing to say. He was the 10th person. So here I'm in a quandary. He wants to join, if I, he joins in the quorum, but he claims to be an atheist, what do I do? I said, Michael, I have to ask a favor of you. I said, what? I said, let me preface it with this story. I said, in the olden days, there was this old uh, this, uh, innkeeper on a big Russian you know, estate. And, he, um, and this innkeeper, um, he was at the mercy of his Russian masters. You know, everybody was basically in those days. They were serfs in effect. And the Russian master's wife says to him, listen, you know, you can't have a Jew running our in. It's just not doable. She hounded him. And even though he likes, he comes and says, listen, it's, you know, Joshua, you have to convert. There's just no other way. See, so he goes home. He says, okay, we have to convert. We convert. A few months, a month before Passover, he comes back to him. He says, you know, my wife feels really guilty about it. She feels it was a nasty thing. You can unconvert. You can go back to being Jewish. So he goes home to his wife. He says, listen, I have good news, Esther. We can unconvert. She says, oh, why are you telling me this a few weeks before Passover? With all the cleaning, everything I have to do, can't we unconvert after Passover? <laughs> I said, Michael, I know you're an atheist. We need you for a minion. Could you un-atheist for at least 20 minutes to join our minion? And he got so upset at me. He says, you can me I can't be part of a quorum. I absolutely have a right to be part of a quorum. I'm Jewish and my whole life. And, and this was very interesting. And when he told over the story at the, not this story, when he told over the other story at the, the 92nd Street Y, he actually gave it a whole different spin. It was a few years later. And it was, he says, somebody asked to buy my share in the world to come. And I responded, of course I'll sell it to you. Because we don't do good deeds for the bounty we're going to get for it. We do good deeds as Jews because it's the right thing to do. Which is interesting. It had an entire, okay, but now you have something to discuss. As lawyers, is it a valid sale or not? So let's talk a few minutes real estate, and then I want to end up with a religious thought. Not a religious thought, a spiritual thought. Um, <clears throat> let's talk real estate. If I was a lawyer today, I was in law school today. And I'm in real estate, well, anyway. And I wanted to enter real estate, the field of real estate. So I'm going to be going up against Harvard and Yale and every Georgetown. Let me just name it. You know, when you go to a decent law school, how would I try to get an edge on an interview? Right? And here's a thought that I would share with you. And I don't know if it works, but you guys can decide for yourself. But you have no idea how often I'm sitting with an attorney and we do around, I'm guessing, 30 or 40 transactions a year. Right? So we, we do, I, I personally, we have in-house counsel, et cetera, but I often, and I'm amazed how very often you deal with some attorneys who know zero about the business aspect of real estate. They could be closing a real estate, it could be a toy company, it could be a divorce, they understand the papers, they have no understanding of the business side of it. Now, that puts them at a disadvantage. Because an intel you want more somebody who can process papers. You want somebody who understands what's worth negotiating, what's what not worth negotiating. What has value? Let me give you an example. How often do attorneys negotiate guarantees from a borrower and the entity is valueless? Because they don't understand the purpose of the guarantee. Just as an example. Right? And they sit there arguing and arguing and arguing, and you're just rolling your eyes like, what the heck, right? <clears throat> so if I were today in, in Cordoz, which is a good school, right? But I know how fierce the market is, where I would be juxtaposing my legal training with, as I know the last thing you guys need is more work, is taking something like one of those real estate courses at NYU, where you can then come to your interview and say, wait, 
I know you've met 30 guys applying for this real estate job. Do you know, I can actually do an Argus spreadsheet. I can tell you every, every deep, I understand how to run lease things, what it's supposed to look like, who are the right tenants for a lease, who are the wrong tenants for a lease, how to understand the credit part of the lease. And suddenly, you're in a class, you're sui generis compared to the rest of the applicants because you understand the business side of what you're transacting. Right? Just as a, a loss, an aside to, uh, to um, okay, let me end off with uh, a thought, okay? But I was speaking to a number of you, and where's Mr. Brill? What's your first name? I apologize. Daniel. Daniel Brill. And he was kibitzing with me that yeah, he wants to go to Yeshiva when he's done. Yeah, when he hits 50, he says his goal was to be, and somebody else was here with Tommy, he was in Yeshiva, but he had to go to law school with us. And I had an interesting thought. And here is a thought, okay. In the penultimate dream that happens in Genesis, in Gracious, the first book, which has been widely depicted by many of the great, you know, both masters as well as uh, post-master paintings, right? We have Jacob having a dream, and there's a ladder that starts at the ground and stretches up to heaven. Right? And this is Jacob's dream. And there's angels running up and down. Right? <coughs> and what's the, what is the metaphor? The entire Bible is a metaphor. And it's supposed to be alive to us. It's supposed to be sort of like a guidebook where we are supposed to, in effect, almost be the protagonists in it and to affect our lives, right? So the Talmud says something very interesting. It says about Jacob, it says when he's running for his life, he says to, um, he says, I was speared from the evil Laban. He says, I was speared by my hard work and the righteousness of my parents, Abraham and Isaac. But he puts work before it. So the Talmud says something interesting. It says, work is more precious to God than the most pious of prayers. It's very interesting. I mean, any rabbi, priest, etc., wax, you get a whack in the face if you said that. <laughs> work is more precious. Right? But let me tell you how I understand it. This is how I understand it. Some people see a dichotomy between religious values or moral values and the life we live. So they'll go to synagogue, to church, to school, they'll learn all type of moralities. When they leave school, church, um, synagogue, they lock the door with a big lock and they go into the world and they are evil. I mean, just evil, right? I see this all the time. <coughs> um, and and the true moral person, where does the tire hit the road? When he leaves synagogue, church, school, home? Or does the tire really meet the road when that morality has to comes into conflict with something that we would like to do at work, on a date, in a relationship? Where does really that morality get tested? Right? So, I think that's what Jacobs was saying. He said, what the Talmud says is, work is more precious than the most pious prayer. Work means where you can take your morality and express it in a meaningful way in your life. That is more precious than a prayer, the most precious prayer, which is disconnected from reality. Because what's the most precious prayer worth if it doesn't really if it's not efficacious, if it doesn't really change our behavior, right? So what is the dream of Jacob? The penultimate dream of his life, it's about a ladder. And the ladder goes up to heaven, and the ladder starts at earth. Now, morality is not about going onto a mountaintop, putting a fence, a chain link fence around the bottom, sitting at the top, and having deep thoughts. That's not morality, that's just disconnection from this world. Morality is the person who says, I know what's right. And right here in this situation, I'm being hit on, approached, asked to do something that's not right. And at this time, my morality, 
I am going to do what's the right thing. I am that ladder. The ladder is where it connects. Right? So, in a way, you may want to go back to yeshiva when you're 50, or you may regret having left yeshiva. But if you can bring the morality into the day-to-day life, that is the highest halo that you can put on meaningful behavior. Right? When you take that when you say, I have, I have the ability to lie or to steal, and I won't, that is a moment. That is a, a moment that you can put a halo on it. That is the highest, that is what Jacob said, my work was more precious than any prayer I've ever said. At that moment, you have connected heaven and earth. Now here's something interesting. In Judaism, law has a different connotation than the way we understand it in America. But like, who is considered the greatest lawyer? In Judaism, the greatest lawyer ever. Who's considered the lawgiver? Is Moses. Moses is called Chalkat or Chalkei Safun. He he is the lawyer, the lawgiver. Law is not just seen as a an arena where two smart lawyers can decide who can outwit each other, which is how you know often we see it in law today. But law is really which this week the Decalogue was given, it's the morality of the world we live in. And, and much of law today, sadly, may not be so moral. So much of American law is bizarre. right? But true law is supposed to be an expression of the morality that is the foundation of the world. So as lawyers, right, you will have the opportunities many times to represent evil people and to do evil things. And I've seen it. I can tell you story after story. Right? But on the other hand, you could say, I, would, I want to take my powers as a lawyer, and I will use them in a moral way. And at that way, my law is really representative of the pillars that uphold the earth. And I am becoming, through law, a partner in creation. At that moment in time, where you don't allow that drive, but you, you have an ambition which tells you to do what's right, you are the ladder that connects, and you are a partner in creation, and you are doing something that's really sacrament and special. So I hope you guys have a lot of luck, and you should all be fabulous, successful lawyers, and I hope to meet you again one day soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.